has expired. And I'm looking at the clock on the wall. We will do one more question, and we'll be out of time. Representative Jacobs is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and, and thank you to our witnesses uh, for the extra five minutes that you'll be staying. Um, I first wanted to echo the sentiments of some of my colleagues about the Sunset Clause. As the chair loves when I remind him, I was in middle school when the 2001 AUMF was voted on, so I absolutely think there needs to be some forcing mechanism for us to reconsider uh, these decisions. Um, I wanted to ask, uh, the AUMF is uh, being used to authorize counterterrorism operations around the world, as has been discussed. Uh, I've been very concerned about some of the reporting we've seen around civilian casualties. In particular, I'm concerned about the department's standard for evidence in identifying combatants, uh, as it appears that the department does not currently uh, presume civilian status in the absence of clear evidence to the contrary, and presumption of civilian status is essential to, the impl to implementing humanitarian law um, distinction and a requirement of customary international law. Uh, so Ms. Krass, will you commit to reviewing the department's interpretation of this legal standard in the DOD Law of War Manual and other relevant guidance? Yes, I will. Thank you very much. Um, and Assistant Secretary Mayor, um, we've talked a lot about the implications of war powers. I want to talk specifically about their implications on Section 127 ECHO and 1202 programs. Um, folks have talked about already uh, some of the uh, instances of violence we've seen uh, that are actually uh, 127 ECHO programs. Uh, the Brown Cost of War uh, Project estimates that there are about 20 programs operating around the world, including uh, in Niger, uh, where we saw uh, the ambush and, uh, you know, largely Congress was unaware of those activities at the time. So uh, given the risk of introduction into hostilities that we know exists for many or all 127 ECHO programs and can infer exists for 1202 activities, how does the Department of Defense interpret its War Powers Resolution reporting obligations in relation to Section 127 ECHO and 1202 programs? And on a related note, how does the Department of Defense interpret authorized ongoing military operations in 127 ECHO and 1202? Is it just Article 2 and the 2001 AUMF, or does DOD think other statutory regimes provide the requisite authorization? So, Congresswoman, I'll answer the first question. The legal question is better handled by um, our general counsel. So, uh, both 127 ECHO and 1202 programs, as you know from your experience on that on the HASC, um, are reported regularly. In fact, in uh, 27 minutes, I'm going to the HASC to uh, to do just that. Um, so, I think as part of that, we uh, do our best to explain the threat profile, how the you know rules of engagement and the authorities are being applied in each one of those. I guess just to since we'll, we'll talk about it there, the question is how that relates to war powers since there is the potential for it to get us into active hostilities as we saw in, for instance, Niger. So we don't see either of those authorities as authorizations to use force in and of themselves. There are appropriations authorizations, and so we have to separately look at questions about whether the requirements of the war powers resolution are triggered when we, if, if the use of force is contemplated. Thank you. Um, and uh, um, uh, Assistant Secretary Meyer, again, I know we've had this conversation, but I, I wanted to talk here a little bit about what the impact of these counterterrorism operations have had on the protection of civilians, and uh, to what extent have those operations contributed to the recruitment of groups engaged in active hostilities against the United States, given that we know civilian casualties are one of the drivers of recruitment for these groups. Congresswoman, it's a it's an issue that we grapple with regularly in determining what are the drivers for individuals to join some of these groups. Um, I think our overall assessment is that as we've driven down the threat through uh, ongoing counterterrorism pressure, um, the overall threat to Americans has gone down. Uh, obviously, in some cases, numbers have gone up of recruits in these groups, but we look at it principally through the lens of what's the overall threat to Americans. Thank you. I'll just say after. Um most of my life of these counterterrorism operations, it doesn't seem like we've actually been successful in ameliorating many of these violent extremist groups. Uh, and so I think uh, it will be important for us to not only look at the authorization, but what we're authorizing and, and how effective it is. Um, and with that, uh, I will yield back, Mr. Chair.